I am a partner in a, a law firm here in, in Napier. We also have an office in Hastings. Um, and yeah, very much a keen consumer of Hawke's Bay, well, food, but particularly beer and wine. The idea today is just to cover off some, some general sort of high level stuff that I think will hopefully be relevant to you um, in the various sort of businesses that you operate. So I think probably the, the first thing I just wanted to say, which I think it's that get your legal advice up front. So a lot of businesses, particularly smaller businesses, only start to take advice um, once things start to go wrong. And one of the things that, you know, I can certainly say from experience is that it's a lot better and it's actually a lot cheaper um, to take advice at the start. So if you're in a situation where you're um, launching a new product, you're taking on investment, you're doing something different, you're scaling up, um, you're launching into a new market, it's a really good time to just perhaps get someone to have a look at your documentation, get someone from a legal perspective to have, to have a look at what you're doing. Um, so the first thing I just wanted to cover off is, is sort of common business structures. So, I mean, there'll be a different range of people with different sizes and, and scope of businesses, but you know, the, the most obvious and simplest form is, is a sole trader. You're trading in your own name. All you need to do is register for tax and GST and, and you're up and away. Um, some people might be practicing in partnerships, so that might be two or more individuals who've, who've um, who've kind of combined your, your efforts into, a, into another sort of structure, and that's your kind of business structure. But probably the key issue with both of those situations is that you don't get the benefit of what's called limited liability protection. And limited liability is really important because what it means is, if you trade through a, a company structure, which is the most normal structure that gives you the benefit of limited liability, your individual personal assets are never at risk. So if your business fails or something happens, which means that creditors are after you or your company, you as a shareholder are not personally liable. And I'm sure that many people who've got um, <laughs> bank facilities know that you sometimes are required to, to give security, but that's a decision you make. So for people who are in the room and you're not trading through a company, I think that's just kind of 101 to have a think about, have you got the right business structure to protect you if something goes wrong in the future? Okay, one of the other sort of common things then that if you've got a company, you often will have some legal documentation that backs that up. Um, so quite often um, people will have a constitution and people will be familiar with that. It's a legal document that kind of covers off your, the way that your business operates under our company's law in New Zealand. But another really important document is a shareholders agreement. So for those of you who are in businesses where you've perhaps taken on investment or you've started up a business with someone else, or you're in business with, you know, with other people that, you've, um, that, you, that you're working with, it's a really important document. What is really important is that if in the future someone wants to change what they're doing, someone wants to get out, or someone wants to do something different, you have that document which kind of sets out everyone's expectations at the start. And I think you can save a, a lot of heartache and, and actually a lot of kind of value destruction, which often happens if people get into disputes further down the line by having a good key set of documents that, that set up your relationship. The other thing just to emphasize is for people who are trading through companies and own your own businesses, many of you will be directors of companies. And I think it's not necessarily well understood for people who are in small or medium businesses that being a director of a company actually brings with it a whole lot of actual overarching legal liability. So when you are a director of a business, you are responsible for a whole series of things to do with that company. You're responsible for the way it operates. And there is actually some potential personal liability with being a director. So on to the next kind of topic, which is terms of trade. So most of the people in the room are either buying something or, or hopefully selling something. Um, you know, you're probably either selling something to consumers or you're selling something to other businesses. And generally, there's two types of um, sort of ways that you would do that. So if you're selling to consumers, um, you'd, you're, you're really generally subject to what's called the Consumer Guarantees Act. And that's the normal law in New Zealand that basically covers off all of your kind of responsibilities when you're selling products to, to people in New Zealand. If you're trading with other businesses, we have um, the Fair Trading Act, and the Fair Trading Act generally covers off how people can, can, um, can sell to, to people who are what's called in trade, so business to business, but you're also able to contract out of the Fair Trading Act. And that's sort of another 
kind of takeaway that I'd encourage people to think about. I would encourage you to have a written set of terms of trade that you can present to people and when they buy things from you, they're buying them on those terms. But if you get into a situation where either you're supplying something to someone and there's a dispute or you're supplying something to someone and they're struggling, it's really important that you have that written terms of trade because again, it can save you a lot of heartache and it can save you kind of money in, in, in the future. When you're talking about the kind of terms of trade that you can have with other businesses, um, I think there's probably two or three things that I always look for when either we're drafting terms of trade or we're preparing them. The first one is I always want to see people contracting out of the Fair Trading Act. If you contract out, then you have a simple written set of terms that you know about and both parties are agreeing what those are. Um, one that's really important is payment terms. Lots of people will you know, send off their um, you know, supply goods, send out an invoice, and if an invoice doesn't get paid, at that point it's a bit unclear what happens. If you have written terms, which include the ability to, for example, charge default interest if someone hasn't paid, you can really start to make sure that there's a, a bit of a, a stick if people aren't paying. And I'm sure everyone in the room has um, suffered at times from being on the wrong end of people who aren't paying when due particularly if there's an imbalance of power, you're the, you're, the, you're the supplier, you're the small guy, you're dealing with someone big, multinational or, or, a, or a national business. If you've got good strong terms of trade, it can make people, um, people, people will run over you if you don't have strong terms of trade. So payment terms with default interest is really important. Um, another one that uh, many people may or may not be familiar with is what's called a retention of title clause. It's really simple, but what it says is, I'll supply you goods on credit. If you haven't paid for them, I still own them. It's a really important thing, particularly if you're um, a, you've got long payment terms, perhaps you have to deal with someone who's on 60 or 90 day payment terms. In, in terms of this retention of title arrangement, you have to register a financing statement. So is anyone, anyone in the room familiar with the PPSR? Anyone, anyone know what I'm talking about? So PBSR, Personal Property Securities Act, that's, that's the act that governs essentially secured credit in New Zealand. And one of the key things you can do is if you are supplying goods or credit, you've got your retention of title clause and your terms of trade, you go in and register what's called a financing statement. It's a simple process that gives you the specific legal protection around what happens if you're supplying goods on credit. The other one that I think is really important is what's called a cost recovery clause. That says that if someone doesn't pay you and you have to go in and enforce, um, you know, take steps to get paid, you can also charge them the costs of getting your money back. The costs might be two, three, five thousand dollars If you can add your costs to the, to the debt, that gives you another lever to try and get paid. Okay, um, I'm just going to quickly change tack a little bit to employment law in New Zealand. You know, we have a written, um, a written act, the um, Employment Relations Act, which governs all employee-employer relations. One of the things you have to remember is that you must have an employment contract. So it's actually a breach of the law to employ someone and not have a, a contract of employment. There's a whole lot of things that our Employment Contracts Act also implies, you know, minimum wage, which many people will be familiar with, hours of work, rest breaks, annual leave, sick leave and holiday pay. And then we have a whole lot of overlays around, you know, what you can do if the employment relationship is not working. Termination, redundancy, all of these types of um, issues are all, are all mandated by employment law. Everyone, will hopefully be aware that we have an employment relations authority. Um, the goal is to never have to end up there. Um, so if you're in a situation where you do face um, claims from an employee or you are in a situation where you're having to um, terminate someone's employment, um, it's just really key to stay out of there because like I said, it's a very employee friendly um, forum because that's the way our law has been set up. Um, one of the sort of things we've seen a bit of recently is people um, trying to avoid having an employer relationship with um, staff. And one of the ways that people have done that is through the use of casual employees. So um, hospitality in particular does quite often, in my experience, use a lot of casual, casual labor. Um, 
I guess the, the, the tricky thing here and something for people to watch out for is that just because you tell your staff that they are a casual employee doesn't mean that further down the line they can't claim that in fact they were a part-time employee and should have had all the usual legal protections that come with being a part-time employee. So if you're in a dispute situation with an employee, the fact that you told them that they were a casual um, employee doesn't, that's not the start and the end of it. If it gets before the Employment Relations Authority, they can look at the nature of the relationship between you and the employee. And actually they could say, uh, that person wasn't a casual employee, they were a, um, they were a part-time employee and therefore you've breached employment law by the way you've treated them, whether that might be the way they're, they're, um, the, the hours that they've been given, the way they've been paid, or the way that the relationship or the employment agreement has ended. But if you've got a relationship like that that's ongoing and there's a frequent kind of, despite it being casual, they have hours every week, they expect that they have a job, you'd expect that they turn up, just be aware that um, that could tip over quite easily from a, a casual employment relationship into actually being an employer-employee relationship. And once you get into an employer-employee relationship, all of the overlays from the Employment Relations Act come in and they're entitled to all of those protections. So again, just one to watch out for. If you're using, using casual labour, just make sure that they truly are casual and that you don't get into a situation where um, ultimately they're found to be something else. I just thought I'd also mention uh, fair pay agreements. This is a, a new thing that's been introduced in New Zealand. The way these work, and they're modelled off in Australian law, it enables a group of workers within a particular industry who are not all employed by the same employer to essentially bring a claim and require um, consistent pay rates and also um, sort of pay, uh, uh, employment terms to be agreed across an entire industry. So change tech into IP and brands. So I think for, for many of you who are um, producers, the one of your key differentiating factors is, is your brands. Um, you know, it's obviously um, something that investors look for. Do you have a strong brand? I think one of the, well, to me anyway, one of the really interesting things we've seen in the last few years is you know, people who are previously kind of commodity product suppliers differentiating and, and trying to get into branding. So, so the whole kind of um, IP and, and branding is a real way for people, um, I'm sure you're all familiar, to, to sort of um, grow your value proposition, to, to create value in your businesses and to, to differentiate yourselves in a crowded market. Um, so obviously once you've got a brand, um, the next thing that's really key is protecting that brand. Um, so for, for most people, the, the usual ways that you protect brands are through registering trademarks. So a, a trademark is um, effectively gives you the exclusive right to sell a market products within a territory using that particular mark. And marks can be, um, can be a word, they can be a logo, they can be a series of words. And particularly if you're in the situation where you've, you've created a new product um, you've launched it and got some traction in a marketplace, you know, and you're looking to get outward investment. One of the key things that investors will be looking at is the value of your brands and also how defensible they are. Defending your trademarks and defending your brand starts with having registered those trademarks in the first place. That gives you the ability to say to other people, I have a trademark against the use of that word or that phrase or that logo. So that's kind of step one. The other thing that you can generally um, protect or use to protect yourself is, um, is the law on what's called passing off. So there are general prohibitions in New Zealand law, and this, is, this has been around for a very long time, to prevent one person from passing off their goods as someone else's. So what that means is I can't go off and um, you know, start a bank that has a similar logo or a look and feel to ANZ's. If you do that, you are um, essentially breaching their, um, their, their goodwill, the, the, the value that they have in their own business, and you'll be prevented from continuing to, to do business um, whilst using those characteristics. That's why we say register trademarks, because that's the first step to saying, hey, that's my brand. And then the third part is you have to show that you've suffered damage or loss. You have to actually show that something bad's happened. You know, so um, 
you can't just say, well, they're copying me, but everyone's getting richer. That's not enough. Um, you'll have to show that something is, is negatively affecting the way that your business or your brand or your product is being, is being sold. So there are protections available. If you've got the right foundations with you know, strong um, brands, strong protections, then you're in a position to defend them and, and that can really be valuable for your, for your business as a producer. That was actually all I was planning on uh, getting through today. Um, it's a bit of a race through things and um, I'm sure some of it will be different um, in terms of its application to, to different people in the room, but hopefully there's something that um, you can all take away that's helpful. 